evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today on a Friday evening. Um, you are welcome to the second episode of Up the Ante Mumbai, Ocha Peksha, uh, which is a series of conversation Vidhi Maharashtra will be hosting this year on various urban governance, planning and development issues of Mumbai. Um, the main objective behind this conversation is to have very targeted and detailed discussions on one issue that we pick, uh, you know, so we'll pick one issue each conversation uh, and we'll be uh, trying to identify law and policy solutions to the, to the issue that we've identified. That's the main objective behind this conversation series. Um, at, in, a, in all of these conversations, we'll be trying to answer three to four questions at, at a very fundamental level. Um, the first question would be, what are your expectations from this city? The second would be, are these expectations met in the way the city is developing? And if not, why, why are they not met? The third would be, how can the governance of the city account for your expectations? And the fourth would be, what happens when there are competing expectations or interests? I see some of you have joined us before for our first episode that happened in January and then you know some of you are new to the to the conversation series. So I'll just give you some some idea as to why we are doing this series. Um, the idea behind this conversation series actually you know started last year. Uh, as a team, we had a briefing book that we launched last year suggesting fifteen different legal reforms uh, for the state government of Maharashtra. And when we launched the book, uh, Justice Gautam Patel, Justice Sujata Manohar were there at the launching ceremony. We had a discussion on the idea of a sustainable Maharashtra, what does sustainability mean, etc. And throughout that discussion, the idea that emerged was that, you know, we should not just be speaking about sustainability, but we should be speaking about fair cities, a fair state, a just state, a just city. And from that idea, we as a team sort of started looking at Bombay more specifically uh, in Maharashtra to sort of see what does a just city mean? What does a fair city mean? What does, what does it mean to have a right to the city? And from that idea is where this conversa conversation series is born. It's, and we think it's especially important this year given the fact that we are going into the general elections, the state elections and perhaps the uh, BMC elections as well to sort of have these conversations uh, have this sort of discourse going amongst common citizens uh, as to what the different problems are in Mumbai and what are the possible solutions uh, that can emerge from these discussions. Our first episode was with Professor Amita Bhiri from the Tata Institute of Social Sciences in January. We had a very fascinating discussion with her on Mumbai's relationship with its informal settlements or what is legally known as slums. And we discussed amongst other things the various gaps in the state's town planning laws as well as the slum rehabilitation and redevelopment laws. Uh, from that conversation, now we are here at our second episode with, uh, with advocate Zaman Ali. Uh, Zaman has earned his law degree in 2014. He's actually a senior from, mine, uh, tr from college. And uh, you must have read his name quite often in the newspapers, uh, but I'll still give a very brief introduction to his work. Zaman has been litigating since 2014 at the Supreme Court, the High Court, lower courts and various tribunals. And while he works on a broad spectrum of cases, he's extremely passionate about environmental law. Uh, he has worked on matters concerning the protection of forests, including the RA forests, critical wildlife habitats, coastal and inland wetlands, national parks such as the Sanjay Gandhi National Park and the Tunga Reshwar Wildlife Sanctuary and coastal areas. His practice is also concentrated on making representations on behalf of the rights of indigenous and other traditional communities as he believes that the issues of environment and livelihood are intrinsically linked. Uh, thank you, Saman, for coming, um, coming to this event today and joining us for this one-hour conversation, taking out the time to do this. The, the, the topic for today's conversation, you would have seen it on our posters and our invitations is, of course, this balance between natural habitats and built environment that the city I believe is currently struggling with. And before I actually come to my first question today, the, the way we'll proceed is we'll have a 45 minute to 50 minute discussion uh, on like four or five questions that I've prepared and then I'll open the floor for audience questions. So before I come to the first question, I'd just like to place a few numbers uh, for the audience to sort of set the context. This is how I you know, sort of set the context in the first episode as well. And I think I'd like to do that same 
same thing over here to sort of give people perspective on what exactly are we talking about. The first number that I'd like to give the audience is of course a number from the BMC's annual budget which was presented last year. So, uh, so last month rather, the 2023-2024 budget. The BMC's annual budget, the total budget was close to 60,000 crores. The more accurate number is 59,954 crores. It's the richest municipal body in the world and this was the total budget number. Out of this, 53%, which is around 31,774 crores, was to be spent just on capital expenditure. This was a 16% jump from last year. Close to 12,000 crores from the BMC reserves is going to be withdrawn to fund ongoing infrastructure projects. This was double the amount which was withdrawn last year. So this is the first set of numbers that I'd like to give you. The second set of numbers that I'd like to give you to sort of contrast is the number on the amount of urban tree cover that Mumbai has lost in the last few years. From 2016 to 2021, as per the Mumbai Climate Action Plan, Mumbai has lost 2,028 hectares of urban tree cover. In the last 30 years, this has been a 42.5% decline and the actual number is 12,446 he hectares, which is more than the size of the Sanjay Gandhi National Park. So this is the other number that I'd like to give you. The third piece of information that I'd like to place before the audience before we get to our questions is just a small brief summary of the various infrastructure projects that are happening in Bombay right now. Um, I mean, I don't need to tell you some of this information because you step out of your house and you sort of see that the entire city is almost like a construction yard. Uh, but just the big ticket I'd like to give you the numbers. We have, of course, a 29.2 kilometer coastal road happening, uh, which is the first half connecting South Mumbai to the Bandra Valley Sea Link. I'm not even talking about the second half right now. This project is being executed for 13,000 crore rupees and it's happening along the coast which is in any case a very vulnerable area uh, given climate change, given like rising sea levels etc. and given the kind of communities that live on, on that periphery, on the coast. Uh, this is also a fairly controversial project because it was made by amending the CRZ notification, uh, something that was challenged in the Bombay High Court as well as, well as the Supreme Court. Zaman was a part of that matter, so we'll be, you know, hopefully discussing that during our questions. So that's one project, you know, that's currently sort of uh, happening in the city. The second is, of course, the Mumbai Ahmedabad Bullet Train Corridor, for which one lakh fifty thousand mango trees are supposedly going to be cleared. The third is of course the underground and overground metro railway project, the first in the city which the money being spent on that project is close to 37,275 crores and of course like everybody knows this is the same project that led to you know trees being felled in RA, close to 2,000 trees were felled in RA for the car shed. Uh, apart from these three projects, big ticket projects, of course you have other projects happening, you have sewerage work happening, you know storm water drains being like sort of renovated portals being sort of filled up etc. So all of those projects are happening and this is just in Mumbai. There are many more projects that are happening in the larger Mumbai metropolitan region which of course have a direct impact on Mumbai as well. One of those projects is of course the Navi Mumbai international project that is coming, coming up um, and that itself is happening on a site which is extremely rich in wetlands, extremely rich in mangroves, mud flats. It's also very close to a bird sanctuary and you know, villages across 10 to 15 villages, I think, being resettled on account of that project. So this is the sort of ecological and social cost in numbers that these projects are sort of costing us, costing costing common citizens. And I've also given you the larger overall number that we are spending on these infrastructure projects. Having given you the background to these projects, I think my first question to Zaman would be, in all of this planning, in all of this development, do you think the environment for for our bureaucrats, for our politicians is an afterthought? Is the environment an afterthought to city planning and city development? Thank you so much for having me. Um, that's a very great start, I would say. This question deserves to be the first, no matter what. Because if you look at how our you know, thinking has been, as far as the governance is concerned, 
with the environment we have i can give you at least 8 to 15 examples straight away which clearly show that the after that we have not learned from our mistakes so if i if i start by giving example of our waste processing that happened in the city now as we collect the two dumping grounds that we had in the city were in mulu and devna and and also some portion of it also did go to diva in thane but you will notice that this was a pure dumping ground that had come up on the creek on the wetland area on the mangrove forest straight away now you will be surprised to know devna is in this particular site for about 25 to 30 years or even more same as the case in bolon which is now even after the closure which happened in 2015 after the high court order is still in the process of removal of that legacy waste so we are 9 years down the line and you can just in perhaps imagine the extent of how big that dumping ground was the mistake that bnc has once again committed is with the kanjama dumping ground that has now come up in the last 6 uh, years around 6 to 8 years along, along the eastern express highway on the mangrove side of kanjama so we have absolutely learned nothing from district and when i when we when i say we i also always will include the government because government is made from is made of the people now the reason why kanjama has gone there was only and only because there were some people who had objected to the plan which was uh, required to be made somewhere in the northern suburbs and that plan didn't work through so what they chose was to completely avoid the written law which is the crz notification that applies here crz emphatically clearly says that especially with respect to mumbai there can be no solid waste management site on the ground so what i see is that now that the matter is also in court i must also point that out what i what we generally see is that the 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 submissions generally made by bnc and their contention is always that no but if you look at it uh the entire area where the construction of dumping ground is really existing is in a non crz area or which is not affected by tidal flow but perhaps the location the wetlands the site inspection reports of coastal zone management authorities pollution control boards clearly show time and again even in court there are 11 inspection reports that say that this is a need a crz a tidal area affected by mangroves tidal flow and it just shows that when there is an entire planning framework that's happening they just do not regard environment or keep that environmental planning at the epitome at the higher so so that sensitivity towards understanding how environment plays a crucial role in planning and governance has been missing and in fact that that is applicable to many other natural habitats because i see that the topic does deal with natural habitats so when it comes to mangrove ecosystem we have a dumping ground today which is inside the creek and it was so really surprised to know and in fact a lot of people would know by now that that same dumping ground is directly adjacent to what today we have is the thane creek flamingo sanctuary so if you look at the development plan of the city and just straight away look how the demarcation of the flamingo sanctuary is on the development plan you will see that the boundary is some of the portions of the boundary is actually going inside the dumping ground and then it moves out and goes towards the other three portions so this is natural that you have toxic leachate from that dumping ground entering the creek and eventually affecting the entire marine biodiversity and that is the case it is a given fact science says so and once you in, in environment it is natural that you have the law has to follow the science it's not the other way science will not wait for laws to develop so science will always be at the forefront for any uh, aspect of planning when it comes to an environmental or sustainable planning so with that perspective i see there are so many examples this is just of mangrove ecosystem to take up the ecosystems of say natural lakes for example bawai lake what the municipal corporation does straight away is to construct a jogging and a cycling track inside the water area by reclaiming the water area around the bawai lake now what is the consequence of it is that along with the bawai lake just there in iit you also have lush green area which is a natural garden area and that is where the crocodiles would generally go and have their uh, breeding spots so these are those are also breeding areas and where you will find the eggs being laid now that access gets completely stopped now it is not the case that there are no experts which are involved who do not understand these basic things but the idea is that when planning is being taken the problem is the discussion that happens within this bureaucracy the 
officer who is at the highest level will take will say x or y will make a statement on x or y and there will be no lower rank officer or any other person who will try to say that your fact is wrong so that sense of self respect and understanding that you have to portray your decision making while keeping everybody in mind is, is missing from the very beginning forget about i'm not even talking about how they should actually discuss this with all the citizens and release all these draft policies and have objections and suggestions over it so that they can have a on uh, a proper understanding of what really matters but this is what the position is so this is power play as as i said then of course you have the huge coastal road as of today well in 2020 or 2024 you are in a city where especially with climate science becoming completely clear today that how sea level rise is going to impact or climate change is going to impact coastal cities more so than a tropical country like india so the 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 outcome of a of a of climate change and the consequences of climate change vary from region to region so in a tropical country what is expected more is that there are going to be higher bouts or higher intensity of rainfall in a shorter period of time and when that happens it's a recipe for flooding so you have a lot of rainfall coming in obviously the water needs to be percolated into the ground water there must be water sponges natural sponges around so that that intense rainfall can be handled naturally because flooding will happen if you don't maintain that because and what we generally see is that the data that is being given these days is that look the rainfall was very normal if you generally see in the last 2 3 years in the when you have the monsoon session in in the middle of the monsoon session or at the end of the monsoon session you will see pnc releasing a press report or imd releasing a press report very clearly saying this was a normal rainfall in fact above average and we have all our tanks are full on the lakes are full with water but what they are missing out is on the scientific aspect on how that rain is taking place now if you recollect we had a july with two weeks of sun last to last year that is something we need to discuss and people should come out and understand it before that we haven't had sun in july and we should acknowledge that being in this location you will not have you will it will be overcast it will have rains but it will be over a period of 4 weeks that 4 weeks has come down to 2 weeks this is the science we are facing this is the climate change we are facing as a tropical city so instead of coming back to this project instead of at least thinking bare minimum which is now a minimum thought process for any travel or any bridge that is to be constructed to bridges for private roads is a strict no no in today's time however if you are constructing a mode of a mode for travel especially through a, through a, through a road then it has to be on stilts it cannot be reclaimed what bnc has done has it has reclaimed 117 hectares of our western coast just between malab uh, priyadarshini park a little bit of uh, a portion near the princess street flower at marine drive so from priya darshan park up to worli 117 hectares of land has been earned from that water in the language of bnc earned now this case was obviously before the high court and the high court come straight away said that this particular project is now being implemented without even having gotten an environment clearance as basic forget about the fact that how the ec process today exists who are the people who are taking decisions at the level of granting environment clearance or not i am not even come going there but to completely disregard this project by saying that it's merely a road and forgetting about the fact that you are reclaiming 117 hectares i'll also talk about the consequences of 117 hectares scientifically what's going to happen erosion of verso and jhu beaches and more however looking at this decision making it's completely clear that Uh, the the high court was straight away in fact was with us and straight away said that this project cannot commence unless you get an environment clearance follow the environment impact assessment process ensure that public consultation happens and what the only clearance that they had received was a coastal regulation zone crz clearance which was also brought in as an exception by changing the central notification so crz notification is issued by the central government and believe it or not the lobby is so strong that any amendment that happens and of course it applies to the entire coast of the country from the western coast all the way down to the eastern all parts but the provisions that get amended in the crz notification are crystal clear that are made to suit the needs of the city always the entire crz notification was amended by bringing a clause to create an exception for this project the coastal road project that happens 
the court said that amendment is general in nature, we will uphold that because it provides an exception to a rule. But for this particular case, it is not an exceptional case that you can't bid it on still. It is not an exceptional case that this is a requirement without which there can absolutely be uh, no, no sense of travel in this city. You do have roads internally and otherwise. So the High Court struck it down. The matter went up to Supreme Court, BMC, and the matter is today pending. I want to make it very clear and in fact make it make people aware about the fact that today the entire road has been constructed merely on the basis of a four line stay order of Supreme Court. We have moved the matter in Supreme Court n number of times, perhaps showing urgency from left, right and corner. Extremely disregard has been given to this project even at the Supreme Court level. Though I am not saying how the decision should go in one way or the other, whichever decision, I am not saying at this moment that the Supreme Court should make a decision, in, take a decision in this manner or that manner, but what we can surely criticize is the manner in which the interim order is passed. And that's how it is. Now what are the consequences of this coastal road? And actually during the arguments as well, you will notice that BMC had argued straight away that this entire city of Mumbai has been built on reclamation. We were a group of seven islands, came together, built causeways between two different islands and hence constructed the whole city as a reclamation and this was their argument. However, forgetting about the fact that today the world is very different from say 18th century when the first reclamation started, which was in 1722 or something. So, so today's times are not considered in while considering making these decisions and just because bureaucrats must have thought in their, in their offices that look reclamation has been a part of the city then uh, so so let's do a coastal road by reclaiming the land and creating open space without referring to the fact that the today's open spaces which exist today are also under complete uh, uh, in, a, in a very drastic situation. So ultimately the consequence of such a reclamation is that how much where will that so much water go? You have so much of tidal water that was coming in and if you have a width of 100 to 200 meters, though I am not a scientist but of course I really have to study science as well as an environmental lawyer that so much of tidal flow, the currents that are coming in on the southern side of the city will have some impact on the northern side where there is absolutely nothing that has happened and if you notice when the reclamation was at its full flow, Varsova Beach started to road and there are pictures of the end where Juhu and Varsova Beach meet, especially the fisher folk notices these things first because it is their land, they understand every inch, every 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 centimeter of a beach beach ecosystem. So 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 that's how we started to see the changes in 2021, 22 and today the, the system is as it is. We have actually reduced up, uh, about 50 to 60 meters of beach has actually been reduced. And the same happened at the time of Bandarabali sea link with the other beach. The other beach used to be about 80 to 90 meters in its width, which is now about 30 meters in monsoon. In monsoon, the tidal water comes in every every day at the high tide. The water is inside the houses of people on that stretch. So the point is that we are not learning from our mistakes. We are constructing, having reclamation done in the city, which is going to face immense consequences of climate change. And uh, not just this factor. Now we have we are, we are not even learning even further. The next plan is to use 5,300 acres of salt and land on our eastern coast for affordable housing. Now, just imagine, there is no stoppage to this. Either there is absolute lack of understanding what is really sciences, or the decision making has become so centralized at the moment. It is so. In fact, it's not even an option because we don't have, we haven't had BMC elections for two years. One single person, the administrator, is running the whole city, takes every decision of the plot, and that administrator is appointed again by the state government. In fact, the entire, we have about 29 municipal corporations in the state, out of which 27 municipal corporations are run by a sole administrator appointed by the government. This is the stage, this is the level of our, uh, our system, our governance. So this has to be kept in mind and, and be, be, be open about this idea of talking things just beyond, I would say, imaginary stories. So why I say so? Because you go to any part of discussion, discussions of which are political, which are important, which deal with governance, planning, environment, are not a part of discussions on daily lives and, and that is something which uh, needs to be focused by the people, by the general, general public and, and we really need to voice this, this
this particular opposition on how can this city run on in, in such a manner run by just one administrator. There are no councillors, there are no municipal corporators. You can't do more on municipal elected municipal council or councillor and say, I have a problem in my ward in an XYZ manner. Absolutely not possible as of today. And uh, so you have the salt dance going in, then there are some natural ecosystems all across. Some we do have some fights, it's not like all hope is lost. For example, Ari Forest. So Ari is right abutting the Sanjay Gandhi National Park. Then the larger plan was to convert Ari into the next BKC. Because going on that side is facing is seeing a lot of economic development. So they thought might as well make Ari a new uh, new SEZ. So they, there was that plan thankfully has been shared because of people. Everybody came down for the RA movement. And I must clarify one thing when we discuss metro and say it's against the environment, it's not. Nobody say no to metro. None of the persons who were in court or who were on the ground opposed the metro line. It was only about the location of the car shed when you had an alternative. And what were the alternatives? Kanjama, where you could make a multi space. We are a space town city, I understand, we all understand. The, but there was a very good proposal to have a two layer Kanjama car depot that could deal with Metro Line 4 and Metro Line 3 together. But it became a battle of ego at one point when NBA government had come. And then after, it's very funny, I can go on. I mean, there could be a, uh, an entire session on this part, but I, I won't go much into detail other than the fact that it was about car shed being in a very sensitive spot where there are at least three to four lepers. In fact, where the site was located was so diverse that during the uh, during the survey that was being done by biologists, they found two new species of RA or two, uh, two sorry two new species of spider, which have not been found anywhere in the world. And the scientific name was given as RA and all of that happened. But the point here is that there is a when you have a biodiversity hotspot, those natural habitats has to be retained in, in that manner. We have a national park within the city limits. And, we, and, and it's, one, it's the only national park uh, in the only city rather, Bombay is the only city other than Rio that has a huge national park within city limits. So there are many, many, many examples like this. Pawai Lake. Rivers. Now, we, you will be surprised to know what we are doing with the rivers. The municipal corporation right now, Mumbai has four rivers. Meethi, Poisar, Dahisar and Oshiwara rivers. These might look like river lakes or small rivers, but they have a huge role to play because they carry the water flow from national parks top and the catchment area is coming from the hilly region of national park to down. What corporation has done, instead of uh, re re instead of making sure the flood the flood plains are restored to its original position, because some of it are back back by uh, encroachment at the moment. There are informal settlements, no difficulty, they could get rehabilitated but re retain your floodplains. Instead of doing that, they have walled the entire river course from the top to the bottom. The top portion where the origin of the river is does not even require any walling because you need catchment area, you need water to percolate from the side and join the river. Now there is a direct obstruction, restriction to the access of water. Therefore, now you will find the river being even drier. And it might lose, to, even furthermore, it would start looking like more like a place where you can just a free play where you can throw things. I'm just talking about the practical perspective of people when they say nothing is just like a free land, people start throwing stuff. And it's not, it doesn't even end there. The, not only has it been walled on all sides, but the river bed has been concretized. So whatever little bit the real work of what a river is, that when it is flowing around, obviously that water is also going and the groundwater recharge is happening, you have stopped that by restricting the access to the, there is no connection between the river and the water anymore, the water and the ground anymore, because in between you have this concrete layer. So it's just, it's not even, I would say, it's, not, it's way beyond even being common sense. Forget about having any basic understanding of science. So, so, there are the, these decisions are all latest decisions. It's not something which is way past 20 years ago, 15 years ago. We know what the science is today. We know how it's going to impact the city. But this is the level of planning that's going on today. And there are more examples. I can give you five. Yeah, no, I think this is just fantastic. I mean, just the number of examples that you pointed out where we clearly see absolute like either apathy or perhaps like you know no sort of sense to why these decisions have been taken, right? Um, and that sort of gets me to my second question. 
which is, and if you could give us specific examples, uh, it would really help, which is to sort of ask you, where do you think the problem lies? And does the problem lie in the text of the law? So, uh, for those of you who are law students, you know, uh, environment, forest, wildlife, etc. is a concurrent list item. So, of course, there are central laws on it, but like states can make amendments to those laws. There are also state level laws on the environment. So, do you think the problem lies in the text of the law? Are there gaps in the law? Or is it the way the law is being implemented? Where do you think the problem lies? Because what I'm hearing from you so far is that, you know, it's probably implementation that is a problem. Uh, it just seems that the people who are implementing these laws for us, you know, are completely disregarding them or sort of like are finding new holes in the law um, to sort of, you know, go around making these decisions. And I think if there are loopholes, then I'd like to know what those loopholes are. So, like, sort of to try and understand where is the problem lying, or is it both? Yes, it's both. It's both. That's the straight answer. And you can you would know what is the common point here. It's the common point between both is that there is lack of lack of understanding on why we require this in the first place. Why do you have to you have to understand why environment is very necessary? See, ultimately the planning. Whoever is planning has to be a person of integrity and needs to understand why this law is here. Be, because, because if I can take you to what Baba Sahib Ambedkar had said to the constitution at the time of framing of the constitution. He had said that however good the constitution is, if the persons who are implementing it are bad, that constitution will always be bad. And even vice versa, he says however bad the constitution is, but the people who are implementing it are good, that constitution will be good. Because it is a direct connection to our life in every sense. Now I think that particular aspect is so so well put in that it applies to every administrative decision making as well. So the, with this perspective, I feel the answer is both. And when you say how our laws at the moment are in the moment, and it, it, it's really unfortunate that if you look at the manner in which in the last 10 to 12 years the environmental laws have or any amendments that have come to the principal acts or any superseding notification that has come to the principal notification, you will always see that they are in dilution. There is a very core environmental jurisprudence which is called the principle of non-regression that has been entailed in the object of any environmental law that comes which is that no matter what, the sole purpose of an environmental law is always to protect and conserve. If you are bringing an amendment, it has to be a positive amendment. Make it stronger to protect and conserve. This is the principle of non-regression. That re Forget about this principle of non-regression, but at the moment, the dilution is so vast. I can give you more examples. Say, for example, the CRs and notification. The dilutions are so vast that what is written in the recital goes completely, the preamble of the law goes completely against the very amendment that has just come in, which wants now say something like in CRZ, an increase in SSI of, of uh, construction or redevelopment that could happen close to the coast. Now we are following a model once again, what, what the western model is blindly. We are just looking at okay, having tall buildings next to the coast, wow it will look very good, oh, people will have a great view and we can sell the money and we can earn through property taxes and all municipal taxes. Now this idea is so strong, it's so so bad because we could perhaps leapfrog that step. What we notice now is all those steps that generally which was taken as per the Western model, those guys are taking a step back and actually going back. For example, a lot of roads in the in Norway, which have really wide roads, are now being converted into two-lane roads so that the rest of the area can have a proper afforestation that has to be maintained as that forever. But here what we are seeing is that we are trying to to increase the usage of our land towards more buildings, towards making it of even more in, you know, increased uh, heat island effect is being created in the city because of this aspect. So CRZ notification, the laws were decent in the beginning in 2011, now the superseding notification of 2019 just does away with the protection. Earlier the protection was at least in 100 meters from the high tide line, it's gone down to 50 meters. For islands, at least there was a protection till 50 meters because we are seeing that sea level rise is going to impact all the islands in the tropical area. That has come down to 20 meters from 50 to 20. And uh, 
perhaps this is just the answer. Then you have the Forest Conservation Amendment Act, where the definition of forest was completely restricted and narrowed down. Thankfully, and we are grateful that the Supreme Court has passed an order recently that the old definition of forest as per the dictionary meaning, which has been in existence since 1996, there is a landmark judgment of the Supreme Court that has remained as it is, that every area which is which looks like a forest and falls within the ambit of a definition, dictionary meaning of a forest as per its dictionary meaning would qualify as a forest. There is no other criteria. So if there are trees, a good level of dense trees would surely be treated as a forest and it would take the protection of Forest Conservation Act. So thankfully that has been restored. So that amendment has in that sense been stayed for a moment. Then you have, if you recollect during the COVID times, you have the EI, the Environment Impact Assessment Notification of 2006 been trying to be amended. They were trying, they, they, there was a draft EIA 2020 that had come in and only because of people's strong opposition even during COVID had they never notified it. So that's, that's another aspect and we have another law which has just come, Jan Vishwasa, yeah. which will decriminalize, decriminalize all the environmental crimes. So we were expecting that there would be some strong deterrence perhaps because of so many violations and if you notice mostly all the environmental uh, disputes that are taken to the NGT or as a PIL before the high courts are already civil in nature. It's not that though criminal is important, but our system of initiating a criminal complaint, especially in the environmental laws, is so regressive that you have to wait at least for 60 days after giving a complaint to central government and wait for 60 days to initiate your complaint before the magistrate. You can't even go to the magistrate or register an FIR unless you give a 60 day notice to the central government. And in 60 days, I mean, you can just take, remove all the evidence overnight. What, what are we talking about? What are 60 days? So we already have this regressive act which allowed the violator to do whatever it could. Now even that much of little environmental protection on the criminal side is completely gone. So absolutely no deterrence effect. And with that, so these are the amendments we are facing today. And nobody is saying uh, no to development at any point in time. It's just that when you notice there are some unique, really important natural biodiversity and natural habitat that requires protection, it's, it's, it's important to preserve them. That will bring the entire country and the cities to the net zero level that we are claiming that we'll reach uh, you know, by 2050. But how far will it go it depends on what you do in your domestic law. It's very easy to go around and in the international uh, conventions and at these climate accords go out and say that yes, we achieved that. But I feel we are not at a correct uh, path in that sense. So this is as far as the laws that are being different. But implementation of the law, I need not say much because some of the examples really did say that implementation of the law is way far from what we would ideally like it, like it to be. So I can take it off. Understood. So what I'm hearing from you is of course, there are gaps in the law, and you've given us very specific examples, the amendments to the Forest Conservation Act, the uh, draft EI notification that came out during COVID but thankfully wasn't passed, the Jan Vishwas Act. We've had, uh, we've had, of course, some of those office memorandums, if you yes. remember, if you know, if you'd like to tell the audience about it, as to how executive directions have been passed under the Environmental Protection Act to sort of dilute the statute. So this is not an amendment to the act, but an executive instruction using one particular provision under the act Correct. to sort of dilute the protections under the act. Correct. So if you could just also, like that's quite interesting because yeah. I, I think that's quite fascinating the way it's happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's happening is I'll just take everybody to the principal act which governs environment protection is the Environment Protection Act of 1986. In that you have a clause, you have sections, which is section 5 that gives section 3 read for section 5, it gives power to the central government to delegate its power as far as possible to issue rules. Now within that power today, are we having all the other environmental laws that are being that are being notified? So what is happening effectively is when you delegate that put from that particular section 5 and when it's a delegating power, thereafter it is only the bureaucrats, the executive that make the rules. So when you look at the notifications across which are governing environmental laws, because the Environmental Protection Act is an umbrella legislation. It will not tell you where, how to protect the coast. It will not tell you how to protect, protect the wetland or how to make sure the solid waste management happens. It won't say. It's just a very short act of 7-8 pages. But it delegates that power only to make rules. 
However, what we are witnessing now, science that way is 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 very focused on every natural ecosystem. Every ecosystem has its own complex issues. So when you have mangrove ecosystem, it has to be dealt properly, no matter what. Right? So so with CRZ, just as an example. Now CRZ notification has been released under that section five by a bunch of bureaucrats straight away and issuing it without any legislation coming in between. So we are today as a parliamentary democracy must legislate all the environmental laws so that there is a scope for debate in the parliament and perhaps also with public pressure we could have a joint parliamentary committee that will come visit like how it happened back then in 2006 for the Forest Rights Act. All across you take suggestions from people, you take and then you bring in a better bill and then legislate again and then pass the pass the bill. Instead of that, what is happening is one fine day a bunch of bureaucrats and that way you have a lot of lobbying at work behind the scenes. So whatever kind of process you want to get in to suit the needs of say developers or whoever, it's very easy to do that because it's going to the, the notification to govern say the entire coastal law is not going to come from the parliament. It will come through the work of the executive, through the work of the bureaucrats. So therefore, with that perspective, we have a CRZ notification today, absolutely abysmal when it comes to protection of coast now. Then you have the solid waste management rules, you have the municipal solid waste rules. These rules that and wetlands rules, it's it's baffling that the if you read the definition of wetlands, in the wetlands rules that have been notified by the executive, it just excludes 70% of the real wetlands which should have been governed in the name of paddy fields or human made wetlands or artificial wetlands. So 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 this this entire governance, legislative governance that we are seeing through these notifications, through this route of bureaucracy needs to stop now. Because now I I, I also understand that and I believe so too that a lot of people have now become more aware about environmental issues and thanks to you and a lot of organizations who are working in this stream and people are aware and want to discuss and want to know more about it. With that perspective, I think time has now come to not, for the central government to not delegate or issue any notification under section 5. Perhaps they should always legislate in the entire dealing with any ecosystem. So that is the part on it. Yeah. So yeah, I think what I wanted to add over here, the reason I wanted Zaman to speak about it is what, to sort of summarize what we're seeing over here is that of course, uh, successive amendments being made to existing laws to sort of dilute the provisions of the laws. Apart from amendments, you also have executive directions coming in under those laws which are diluting protections. And if that was, you know, that was not already making the situation worse, you also also have very uh, poor implementation of these laws happening side by side. So it does seem like a quiet, to be honest, scary situation. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I missed one something very, very important. It's mm -hmm. too egregious to not uh, discuss this, mm -hmm. which is that. Uh, you have a you have an environment clearance process. Sorry to cut you off. I just wanted to add that you have an environment clearance process under say EI notification. You have to get an environment clearance no matter what. Similarly, you have a clearance under CRZ clearance. No matter what, you have to see whether you fall within the permitted category and you have to get a CRZ clearance. Both of them are obviously by commonsensical approach and also the jurisprudential approach of precautionary principle has to be done prior to construction, prior to initiating any work. Now, what happens in 2021 and in 2023 as well, that Ministry of Environment and Forest at central level issues not even a notification, not even an attempt to amend the notification which is already issued by the executives, but it's, it's, it issues a circular and an office memorandum. An office memorandum which says that now all the projects which are in violation of EC because they did not get any environment clearance and they have started the construction are eligible to apply for something called a post facto environment clearance. This concept just thrashes every small, every principle, every jurisprudential aspect of environmental law. That you have to have a prior study because to, before a construction starts you need to study its impact, how impactful it is going to be in the forest area or in a coastal area whether it's going to create uh, you know, issues with respect to reclamation, whether it's going to have an impact in the neighboring plot or not. So bearing that in mind, you have to have a prior approach. So this circular is released even by, by the ministry at the director level, straight away by way of an office memorandum, which should have been amended 
no matter what, but straight away a circular for post facto environment clearance and similarly for post facto CRZ clearance. Same situation happened even for CRZ. And therefore, now thanks to both the office circulars are now stayed, one by the High Court, one by Bombay, and one by Supreme Court. The stay was given for the asking on the first day of hearing because it just is too efficient. It's you read it and it has to be stayed. So this is the level of thought process when it comes to environmental laws today. And just before I get to you know the next couple of questions, which are my last questions, just on this you know because it does seem like a very you know scary situation that we are in. Is there any beacon of hope uh, that we get from the judiciary? Do you think you know the judiciary's in interpretation of the law in such cases is giving us some hope? Because we clearly see the executive is failing us, the legislature is failing us. Is the judiciary failing us or not? No, I wouldn't say so. So thankfully, uh, I must point out that the judiciary has been has has been receiving the matters of environment quite well, quite professionally. It's another point that. Which forum do you go to, and how? What resources that forum has is, is an issue because uh, constitutional courts are are taking a stand that when your enactments or amendments are really not matching the real purpose and the object of that act, you we are seeing that the courts are taking a stand and to stay those particular legislation, and we are really grateful for that. However, if you look at the aspect on say a small smaller issues. These are all the larger issues with notification and policies, and it's important, no doubt about it. But for example, if you notice that there is a complete, there is a reclamation of a small lake that's happening in front of you, and you wish to go to uh, the forum, which is the National Green Tribunal today, you want to, you know, adjudicate the matter, you send a letter or hand make a letter petition to the NGT or appoint a lawyer and make a petition and go to the NGT. The problem with NGT these, not just these days, in fact, in the last four to five years is that the matters are not heard in the manner in which it should be with environment issues. The man, because environmental issues are always matters of urgency. In so many natural habitats and ecosystems, they, it could have an irreparable harm. It cannot be remedied because we know that the, judi the, the judiciary generally thinks that whatever is done, it is possible to repair it, it is possible to put you back into the same position, which is the status quo ante. But that is really not possible with some extensively important highly biodiverse areas. So in that sense, uh, you know, the, I do not think uh, the tribunals are really functioning well in that sense because uh, there, the, either there is lack of training or lack of sensitivity, but we are also not finding judgments that could be very encouraging because uh, be it any environmental clearances that are getting challenged, the rate of dismissal of any appeals which are filed against the environment clearances, be it for mining or be it for any purpose, is now more than 95 percent. So it, it, it's not the best scenario, but I would say that is there is hope. There is certainly some hope. However, I feel the NGT in that sense could do better. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that, Saman. Um, my next question to you is now slightly digressing from the issue of environment to people, to communities, right? And uh, you represented, you know, some of these communities in your matters as well. Uh, so my question to you would be, you know, with the help of examples, could you tell us how these infrastructure projects have an impact on the communities, like mostly vulnerable marginalized communities who are living in the city, and how problematic is it? considering the fact that we have enough evidence to show that climate change is going to have more of an adverse impact on these communities as opposed to you know people living in high rises. These communities are more susceptible to adverse impact when it comes to climate change. And yet when we have these infrastructure projects, it is these very communities that are resettled, that are you know, removed, displaced, their livelihoods are impacted, etc. Um, so could you could you elaborate a bit about that? So, well, so, thank you for that question. In fact, the best person to answer this is Mr. Nand Kumar Pawar, who is here on my left, and he represents a lot of fishing communities. He's himself a fisher folk, and he does fantastic work. So what we are, what we see is that every project that is taking place on the coast, you look at all sorts of wetlands as well as our mangrove areas. The mangrove ecosystem is a very important breeding ground for the fisher folk. Now, we are a city. Bombay, Mumbai is a city of Kolivaras, which are the fishing villages. We have more than 20, 25 Kolivaras in the city. In fact, if you include the MMR region furthermore, 
the idea that they this, these communities have been involved in in the growth of the city has been completely washed away. There is no consideration of their suggestions when a policy comes in because they are the first persons who get affected straight away, as you correctly pointed out. And what happens practically these days as well for any project that comes in, reclamation is a huge problem, no doubt about it, because you can't reclaim. There are so many fishing villages on the coast that what happens when you reclaim is that complete, there is a complete decimation of that fishing village in the region because after say every 5 or 6 kilometers we have a new fishing village. So to rehabilitate them is not an option because fishing is their only livelihood. And not with the reclamation happening, you will notice that in Coastal Road as an example, at the Worli exit, the Worli Kodiwara ensured with complete insistence that in fact they even went to the High Court and finally got uh, an order which said that which allowed them to have a passage through underneath the coastal road with complete with, it, with enough space for their uh, motor uh, boats to also travel across. Now these are few things. These, this is the there's a navigation issue. There's an access issue. But mostly, you notice all the infrastructure projects come close to the coast, and those the area around the coast is where you will find mostly the breeding grounds of crustacean species, or there are these are the places where you find fishing eggs. Generally, fish lay egg on the coast, other side. So you have these mangrove areas mostly and mud flats where you find a lot of biodiversity, which is where the fishing really happens. The, the traditional style fishing happens on the coast, and eventually we are noticing that there has been absolutely no policy in that regard. When how the fisher folk have to be have to be not just compensated, it's not just about about compensation, but completely uh, rehabilitated in the sense that. They, they should have a voice or an opinion when that project is coming in place because perhaps they can say that how what could be the width of the pillar that will not have an impact on that particular spot which is a breeding spot. So you know these are traditional, this, this is all falling within the ambit of traditional knowledge. The scientists and engineers sitting in the BMC commissioner office will not understand. They will simply look at from the engineering point of view and say that okay we keep a span of 18 meters between two pillars not realizing that perhaps 8 out of 10 pillars are falling in a core biodiversity spot. So your engineering can change around science. Instead of 8 pillars, have make it a little taller, make the bridge a little taller and have wider span. Two, two pillars between say 100 meters could perhaps be more sustainable ecologically. This is just an off the head uh, you know, discussion, so an example. But, but these are the things, when you do not take their opinion in hand, especially the traditional community, you do not acknowledge the importance of the traditional knowledge that they have, is where the problem lies, because environment and livelihood is directly connected. You have the fisher, fisher folk communities, these are marginalized, all this way. You have the tribal communities in places like RA forest. You still have paras and tribal hamlets in RA forest and in the national park. Obviously, it's very easy to equate the national parks uh, tribals these days by saying they are encroachers, that's the trend. Every day you say, oh, are they uh, encroachers or hamlets? Without taking an effort to understand are they really or not. So, with, this was also the case in the Metro Karshat point because that was falling within the tribal hamlet and within a very important sacred grove of that particular tribal hamlet. So, so they were also a party in the matter discussing about their traditional rights which are getting affected and which are not even being considered even once. Like you can't keep, you can't treat only certain kind of people from an elitist perspective as human beings. This is what we generally see these days that the you know decision making is so so contrasting now that it is only for the for the five percent say vehicle users is what the coastal road is being made. Without even without by, by now there's not even a single plan on how many BST buses that they're supposed to run. So these are the decision making problems which emanate from this idea that we are only here to for people or who can who have a certain economic background is what we generally see and that has an impact on understanding the understanding the fact that livelihood aspects of the consequences that you have through these projects are missed out. So Mumbai that way boasts of a lot of lot of amazing communities and I think they have to be taken uh, they have to be considered at every decision making level which is missing. And this is and, and Fortunately, just recently, one of the landmark high court judgments, you will notice that the uh, one of the bench of Justice Kadhawala in the Maria in Machima matter, where the jurisprudence for the right of, the right of fishing has increased 
In fact, it has empowered the fisher folk to, to, to some extent where the judgment clearly says that the customary rights of fishing has to be kept at, the, at a very high pedestal when taking any decision on any infrastructure project along the coast. And thereafter a policy has come up but that's still not matching with the text of the judgment. So there's a, there's a challenge that is also underway on that. But there is more to me about the fact that decision making needs to involve marginalized communities of our city. In fact, they are the first persons who have been in the city. Everyone has everyone has come later on. So the Kolibaras and the tribal communities, forest communities have to be taken care of. Before this judgment, there was no policy. Absolutely no policy. There was no policy. So this was a prayer in the court as well that perhaps there is no policy, and it should not be. What happens is that when you ask for a policy to make sure that you compensate them well if there is an infrastructure project, the immediate mindset is that okay, we will always give the we can get whichever project we want in any area now because now we can throw money at them. Yeah, that, this is also a problem from the perspective. Now you have a policy, but now the government will start using this only. So, so what happens is the dissenting opinion or uh, option of the fisher folk that we do not want the money and we do not want the project just goes away. What if they are opposing the project entirely? You should still listen to them. Now the problem is that sometimes the judge, the, the executive, the decision makers would straight away say that no, but we provide you compensation, though it is hopelessly low. The policy that has come up after this judgment is hopelessly new. It doesn't cater to the generational wrong that's going to happen. And Tata Institute of Social, Social Science through Professor Gitanjali have done a fantastic study about on this point. So in, in, in that sense, uh, uh, there is some development only through the judiciary. And we see that some jurisprudential approach towards fishing has increased. In fact, there is no other judgment in the country in that regard, which is as detailed only and only on the customary rights of fishers. And that's a good thing in my opinion. But at the decision making level, I am not the I may not be the you know correct person to answer this entirely because it has to be from the community. I just represent them, so in that sense I am able to give you an answer through them. But I think Mr. Pawar and someone like him would be the best person. Uh, no, we surely like to hear Mr. Pawar speak after after we done with our last question, because our last question is actually what you just touched upon, is like on people sort of getting together yeah. and you know citizen movements basically yeah. right and um, what I'd like to ask you is that all of this that we just spoke about all of these problems whether it's a problem with the implementation whether it's a problem in the text of the law would, would all of these problems lead to anything if the, you say there is no cultural change happening at the ground level amongst people from what I understand citizen movements at least in Bombay, are fairly fragmented. They're very project specific, of course. You know, some park in Bandra, you know, uh, some reservoir in Malabar Hill. Uh, so they, they seem to be very fragmented. And um, say, Baling Are, uh, you don't see a lot of people getting together and, you know, sort of defending the environment, you know, going to their political representatives, sort of demanding things, etc. It doesn't seem to be much of an election issue, at least is what I understand and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so my question to you would be, do you, I mean, firstly, do you think that's actually the case? Do you think citizen movements are sort of weak here in Bombay and fairly fragmented, firstly? Um, secondly, also what do you think regular citizens can do if they are fragmented, if they are not working out, what do you think regular citizens can do to help people who are fighting, you know, for the environment? So what is it that we can do? And especially I think it's a very important year for us what do you think we can do? Apart from like just talking about it, what do right. you think we can do? To answer your first part, I would not say entirely that the citizen movement is slow here. It's about who is being shown in the media and whose image is projected when somebody comes on the road more. Because if you look at the fact that we have a lot of fishing community protesting left, right and centre, but that will not be shown in the national media or the, even the English media or the Hindi media. But yes, it will be shown in Marathi media, but they, they, that may not have as big of an outreach as you would like. You take fishing communities, you take tribal communities, you take people who are protesting against the Anganwadi workers, who are, who, Anganwadi workers who are wanting their rights to be given. All of them used to be on the road and they would protest 
in open spaces, in open areas, and that has and that entire culture has been shunted to the backside of Azad Madan. You can't today go and protest on the road, and if you do, then there's always you realize that there's a perpetual section 144 order that's going on. More than five people can't be together. Soon. So you, these are the aspects. So it is, it is. This is not some. I think this is systematic on how to make sure that protests are at the bare minimum in any city, and it should, it should not be projected as much because it could be a power issue. And these are always seen as things like being set up by the other side, by the other political party X, Y, Z, which really doesn't make sense because if you look at the demands, you see how it's going. But anyway, in my opinion, it, in in that sense, citizen movement do exist. Yes, there is a there is a scope for for the improvement. We should we should ensure that uh, you know more people in different areas, in fact, make ourselves aware first about really how bad big or how bad or good this issue is from your perspective and just do not only think about how it will impact me because it will always impact you in one way or the other something that is going on environment is such that it will not close the doors or it will not come into your doors just because you uh, you feel that it's not going to affect you for something that happens say with the coastal road reclamation in south of the city 100% will have an impact in the north of the city and it's already happening so environment will have a direct impact on you one way or the other, including the air pollution issues that we know of today. So, so in that sense, being yourself more aware and ensure if you are, you feel you are aware and you are, in, you know, wanting to uh, spread this word around. You have to have these discussions even at personal level, wherever possible. Forget about bringing it this down and because how do you unite yourself? You start uniting yourself with people around you and then take it forward. So that is one important aspect. Thereafter, I believe, uh, you know, making representations in the government, though, you know, it will fall to deaf ears, no doubt about it, but but still, and at least trying to go to, to your ward officer and complain about the issue would be a very important aspect, especially when you unite together as an organization or an association. You know, force, I'm, I'm not saying that you think these things should happen in your daily life between Mondays to Fridays, but perhaps on a Saturday or Sunday, you guys, people could come together and approach their ward level officers. Nobody wants you to come to the municipal corporation and only deal with the municipal corporation. We have so many wards, go to the ward officers, discuss with them, tell them their issues. If they don't, then perhaps at least if you have busy, busy, busy lives, then please support the organizations of the city who are actually working on the ground on a daily basis. There are a, good, a lot of good organizations on the ground. Support them. They need your support. They could, there are plenty of organizations from the community side, from the NGO side, which really does require. So read up on which are the good ones and perhaps, you know, reach out to them, tell them this is an issue and you are willing to help them in whichever manner. So society will work in this fashion because no individual person can change things overnight, no matter what. So with that background, I think uh, there is scope and Mumbai has been a city of uh, you know, protests. Then. We have a long history of the entire freedom movement has its base here. So it's in the it's in the people, no doubt about it. Just that you have to, you know, become more aware and get out and be there. So I think there is there is a lot of hope and scope for people to, you know, unite further on many issues. Okay. Okay, no, thank you. Thank you for that. I think that was that was my last question uh, for today. Uh, I think we've already, you know, exceeded yeah, I think we are around one hour. We started around 10, 10, 10 minutes late. So perhaps we can now, you know, open the floor for audience questions. We can take maybe three or four questions. And I'd just like you to first introduce yourself. If you're, you know, with an organization, please tell us your organization name. And if you could keep the question really short, that would be very helpful because that way we'd be able to cover more questions. And if you have a comment, you know, maybe we can discuss the comment post post the discussion. So that way uh, the, the the focus is on the question and sort of answering the question and not really comment. We can we can have comments perhaps you know informally we can get together up because there's going to be tea, coffee, snacks. So we can sort of discuss comments uh, you know perhaps during that time. So uh, so I yeah I think we we'll, we we'll have we we'll have questions now. Ari colony, uh, these things. Now, government divided the people, and uh, because they says that uh, you know, if you don't have a 
the station over there in the RA, then the mass people are in the, you can see the how the people travel in Bihar and other trains. So if you don't have a metro, the majority people will suffer. And green lobby says that okay, why are you cutting the cutting down the tree? So in that situation, what the majority, the, what we should do? So I had touched upon this though, but I can just you know give you a small recap. So this issue was not merely about cutting trees and it is not about metro, entire metro line. The metro is very much required, it was always the case that metro is needed, nobody opposed the metro. It was only about the location of the car shed, when you had good alternatives. The idea of sustainable development is always that you need to look at adequate alternatives. And in this case, there was a, uh, there was a car shed that, that could have come up in Kanjur Mark in a pattern where two uh, car sheds could come together in the Kanjur Mark or the east, near, near the Eastern Express Highway. And the second option was near the Kalina uh, Mumbai University land. So with that perspective, the metro car shed, it's not that the green lobby or this the organizations were just all out saying, oh, don't cut the tree. Of course, there was an involvement of tribal communities because there was there were sacred groves around it. Other than this fact, there were alternative uh, alternatives that were available for the government to take a decision. Only problem was if it had become an ego issue with the CM of that time. So that was it. Exactly. So the idea was that make car shed in Kanjurma was coming up for the Metro 4 line in any case. There was a plan thereafter to convert or to move the Metro line 3 car shed to Kanjurma as well and then make a composite car shed for both lines together which was the most cost effective could have saved at least 900 to 1000 crores by just doing this I am just giving you the number of monetary number other than that how the value of uh, the monetary value of the, eco the ecology that could have been saved is exceptionally high in any case so it could have been worked out but like I said it became an issue of ego during project site for uh, multiple metro car shed yes three from any uh, CRG violation, there are no mangroves or wetland like exist. Just slum around it. It's a draft that is cultivated by some miscreants. Nothing about them. that. There is no biodiversity exists. I'm from the same area. And you can save a lot of money, taxpayers' money. Why can't we take that option? In the metro is going to counter all the locations, multiple chances of right. economic development. This is the thought process of the government in which we are not considered. I am also fighting in that case. And with, with those efforts, yeah, with the, with the efforts of the RA movement, yeah. perhaps the car shed has come today, but the other projects have been shelved at the moment. So there was, a, the, like I said, the plan of making a new SEZ, something like AKC right. in RA, that has been shelved. Because there are a lot of, as you have said, nobody object major car shed. They object only location. Correct. And whether there are viable options, why can't we take it? Absolutely. Time and again, you reiterated that the uh, higher levels of judiciary has been cooperative with uh, the concerns of the civil society. Uh, my question is if there is such blatant disregard of the law at the executive level, at the corporation level, why aren't exemplary costs yeah. attached to it? If the judiciary is so uh, stringent upon the fact that they want to uphold communities and the environment, shouldn't they make examples out of? Uh, you said executives, commissioners, IS officers who just randomly stray statements that we should have this and it, then it gets done. Absolutely. That's a very valid question, question and I must point out that the cost gets imposed. For example, uh, an, an undertaking was given by MMRC and Mumbai Metro Rail Corporation for the car shed project that the whatever trees get cut, the afforestation will happen and the trees have to be maintained, which they fail to do so. In fact, wanted to cut further trees for which they had no permission. They went ahead and cut it. Supreme Court imposed the cost of 10 lakhs on MMRC because they did that. But the point is, the very point is that's again taxpayers' money. Yeah, precisely. That so is that again, be so on it the has issue. to be the person. Yeah, it has to go on that person, <coughs> and personal cost must be imposed yeah. on the decision-making authority. Right. And that should include the name of the officers, and that should be a part. That 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 is where all a very strict. Strictures must be passed against those officers straight away. So that is why it's like it because they are imposing costs, you're very right, but there's no deterrence effect. Because they know it's not going to go out for money. Because since you work in the field, you must be more 
Okay. You mentioned in Ali they are trying to build a second PKC. Somewhere I read that to connect Ani and the central and the western suburbs a little better, they are they are trying to build a road under G N L R. Yeah. Is that going? Oh, or a real plan. The first plan was to have a bridge. Yeah. Via the Sanjay Gandhi Sanjay National Park. Then the alignment changed to make it not via Sanjay Gandhi but via RA. Okay. So this was again a bridge. Where but again there were a lot of protests and of course organizations like Manshakti did place on record what could be the alternatives and now that plan has changed entirely to an underground. Does it reduce the repercussions? What, what does it do? Environmentally, yes. It does. It does. It okay. By a huge margin. Yeah. However, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a scientific expert but as far as we see the impact assessment shows that this alignment yeah. would certainly be far less because not even a single tree is getting cut or not more than 10 or 12 trees. That's on both sides of the opening. So we are saving almost 5,000, 4,000 trees straight away. But you have to see uh, something very important is at what, what is the timeline when these decisions are made and it really matters ultimately when you discuss about citizens movement or our personal responsibility, it all comes down to just where you, who you vote. You like it or not, who you vote and from what do you see, what you look at while voting really matters. Someone who you think has at least some thought process towards the environment while making a decision. I think that government does deserve a second thought in one way or the other. So these are the things your one has to keep in mind while voting. Voting is a very important part. I just have one question. Do you think one of the problems is Is, is extremely important as you said so this this forms the core of the plan. 
Correct me if I'm wrong, I think the development plans until a very long time did not even indicate open spaces in the city. Yes, 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 right? yes. In the earlier DC, yeah. yeah in the earlier DC, yeah. And that is when the open spaces policy had come up, which had actually just included only about 60 to 65 percent of uh, the real the, the open spaces in comparison to how many existed. And because of which we have, as per the Mumbai Climate Action Plan, we have lost about 25 to 30 percent open space in the city since uh, 2005 until 2020. So, so that's a huge number. Of so numbers. basically I uh, co-founded the Save Hanging Garden campaign uh, in September of last year uh, because of the Malabar Hill Reservoir now under threat. I'm also a Sivari campaigner and also joined the Mumbai Coastal Road campaign which will take us anywhere. Uh, my question to you is that we are portrayed as being anti-development. Now the Malabar Hill Reservoir actually is about demolishing a perfectly good reservoir as stated by the structural engineers who went in and saw the condition it was in. And uh, the builders, we know that the builders and the BMC and the politicos are all behind the campaign. Now how do we counter, we are portrayed as being uh, you know, anti-development, we are portrayed as being activists. How do we counter these narratives? People don't want to join campaigns because they feel that, oh, this is for the betterment of the city. We need more water. Yes, you need more water, but if you destroy 400 trees, how are you ever going to get rain and then therefore more water? So my question to you is, how do we counter these narratives which are being spun against concerned citizens? No, of course. No, of course. This is faced by every person who protests and may not be just from an environmental side. So that's the thing, the whole idea to create a culture where whoever protests becomes anti-national or, or against yes. development. Yeah, and, and perhaps you all you know they would want you to get charged into UAP and Dada and whatnot. So anyway, the point is, see, you, as long as you know that when you're giving an information to any person who is still, you know, a little centrist about whether to join or not, you as a person who is well read about the issue, you, it is up to you as well to make people aware and your other group members who are with you at that point of time. So you have to be objective and realize in which mental state we are living in as a society. The human psychology has changed from before. Let us accept that. And to the negative, unfortunately. We are becoming shallow-minded and narrow-minded and it's not the best thing for the country overall. However, when you are with that perspective, if you go, it's better if you take a perhaps 10 minutes more to explain the issue while always giving practical alternatives. In your case, and really hats off that the, the, the BMC actually agreed to go for the another report of IIT. No, but they said that they will only go by the IIT report, only, so not by the uh, three other structural engineers. Correct. The other structural engineer reports clearly yeah. said that this reservoir can yeah. said that this reservoir can continue. Yeah, back to square one. Back to square one. They still want okay. to make money out of Correct. 700, Correct. yeah. But perhaps leading them to this decision is only and only because of their movement, no doubt about it. And you're going strong, perfect. I'm, I'm not sure if this matter has reached the court yet. Not yet. Not yet. But, but, but eventually, it will go but, the way. Correct. That's the last resort in any case. But however, to bring in more people, I think it's better you have to host sessions on weekends, have talks, and I'm sure you are having talks with yeah, people like Zoro and yeah, people like we, we and are, people yes, and listen yeah. to their problems and listen to why they say I'm anti-national. Anti Just ask them, okay, tell us, what do you think, why am I an anti-national? Yeah. Ask them the question, put the question on them and then try and reason with them. Because the perspective today is such that people come with that package now. Whatever you oppose is against the ground country. No criticism. My question is, I am quite appalled by the Environmental Protection Act itself. I'm just taking a basic umbrella legislation that you said. Do you think, given that we are in 2024, okay, and that fact there are several departments who need to you know, be part of this whole urban planning and development projects, do we need to have laws which are, you know, I mean, really revamped, new legislation, or very strongly amended legislation which also mandate this dialogue between you know the different arms of planning and also have when I say deterrent, it should be also not just a fine, a monetary compensation like, like you said, paid out of the tax payers' money, but criminal liability. Today in the IPC we have just two sections 
you know, malignant act where you have to Negative. cause disease, yeah, yes. which yes. is which is ridiculous for you to prove the ingredients of that, you know, that to that standard and which was relevant hundred and odd years ago. But basically, do you think the I feel the way the tribunals function, especially the NGT, is supposed to be people friendly, and you just write a letter, but a letter never gets treated as a petition because they come up with twenty objections from the department. And they say we are over it. That's important. Exactly. exactly. So, do you think new laws or amended laws, which take into consideration the current situation or the developments in the past five years? I would still. I would say, ma'am, uh, the principal laws which had, which were uh, enacted, say back the earliest laws in that sense, including EPA of 80, the Air Act and Water Act, once again do have good provisions and they they do espouse for a criminal action to be initiated like Section 15 of Environmental Protection Act is an entire act that's only dealing with the penal consequence of an environmental law. And they are very widely worded as well, which will bring in the protection regime in the manner in however we like. I do not see large scale amendments other than the recent dilutions that have turned to be to, to go back from because the recent dilutions are extreme. Other than the recent dilution, I do really do not see a requirement for a new law or an amendment to a new law. Once again we go back to the square one of who really is implementing it and how sensitive are they about implementing it. And even if they are sensitive, on what basis are they taking the decision? Is it a centralized decision being taken by one person? Are we really going forward and decentralizing decision making in this country or not? So be it at the central level, state level, municipal level, panchayat level, are those laws which require those authorities to function independently? Yeah, is it happening or not? So however bad, like earlier I pointed that out, however good the law would be, but people who are implementing it are bad, that law will always be bad. Just taking the cue from Baba Sahib of Bitcoin. So same thing applies. I have, in my opinion, from 70s and 80s, those laws that have been enacted are fantastic. With a follow-up question on that, you know, uh, the Indian Water Commission has been earlier asked. Perhaps our town planning laws. Correct, correct. So the other laws, yes, they need to, in absolutely right. So town planning laws, which at that point in time didn't cater to the environmental right. consequences, will have to blend in yeah. and get. Uh, so, but as far as like Ma'am's question was on direct consequences of from coming out from an environmental law, from an environmental legislation such as EPA is available under section 15 on the criminal side. So they, they do exist. Merger, merge is, you know, a sort of merger is required with, with respective state laws and municipal laws. And something which was perfectly, I would say is really good from a planning perspective was the Mumbai Climate Action Plan. The first ever action plan that any city in the country had done which was in 2021 and it was fantastic that they did this. In fact, Chennai and Bangalore at the moment have followed Mumbai, Mumbai's path and released it. But now, once again, with the change in government, we see that it has gone back to you know, the cold storage. Nobody discusses, no, no, the website of Climate Action Plan has not been updated since one and a half, two years. So keep in mind who is really taking efforts and deciding for you when it comes to environment and planning. And then vote accordingly. And just one other thing, over here, you know, I think you touched upon it even in your uh, answer. I'll pass on the mic to the audience in case there are questions, but just a, a thought that I had. Which requires a completely different discussion altogether, you know, right now discussion is the number of these different special planning authorities, development authorities that we have in MMR, you know, and the coordination between these different authorities. Uh, again, I think it all comes down to town planning and how are, you know our cities are planned, how, how these regional plans are developed, how these development plans are developed, um, how democratic are these you know decision making processes, um, is the environment being taken into consideration, what are the sort of actors involved because it's just mind boggling the number of special planning authorities and areas that we have and then you know, for example, you have a you have a you have a court case currently the Bombay High Court on potholes, and the BMC saying we don't even have jurisdiction. What, exactly. So I'm sure a lot of these problems are sort of also stemming from the fact that there are multiple authorities involved who are not sort of speaking to each other. You have plans being sort of drafted, developed without any sort of. I mean, I know at least for the latest development plan, there was some sort of decision-making process that was democratic. They had different groups come in, give comments, etc. 
but it at least not there under the law. We discussed with Professor Bidhi also last time, is that the, the process of making a development plan is so one-sided, like there's maybe at least in the law, there's nothing that says that public comments have to be taken into consideration. I think there's just one provision that says. Yes, there is a, there's a process laid down under 37 of MRD, yeah. when they yeah. development plan, they, they do invite objections and suggestions, yeah. no doubt yeah. about it. But how you treat them and then make modifications to exactly. the plan is the problem. Exactly, because it doesn't say that you consider the plans, give reasons, right. like there's no, there's just one provision. Yes. So I think our town planning laws is effectively like where the problem lies, where there are multiple issues sort of arising. Absolutely. You know, when it comes Absolutely. to that. Absolutely. Well, when you are working on ground, I'm very uh, far away from this. Tell me who to support, probably read up where and what. Well, you'll find that with your own research when you start, but uh, I don't want to name many organizations and give you a list as such, but you have organizations like One Shakti, Conservation Action Trust, Bombay Environment Action Group, and even individuals like Mr. Pawar for come representing fishing communities and so many other uh, you know, members of say tribal groups and associations. So perhaps you know, if you delve further, it's not very difficult to find and it can also be close to your heart, uh, what kind of interest you are. You, if you would like something to do with say marine ecology, you want to do something for the deep sea, then there are organizations that do so. There are, I'm just forgetting the name, but I can tell you there's a marine biologist based out of uh, Andheri who has come back to the city, I'll give you the contact and this person does that. So similarly you have One Shakti doing for wetlands, mangroves, uh, you know, national park, forest areas and perhaps you can look at their background, their past work and they just backing off what you said with a number of different authorities involved in like the decision making and you know who is the ultimate decision maker at a municipal level, state level, whatever, if it goes to national? So what is the involvement of the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change and what role do they play? Because isn't it a little contradictory that they have like these conservation and management programs happening at, you know, at let's say national level, but then when it comes down to municipal, so many communities are being affected and pollution. And like you said, whether a bridge is being built you know, on this side of town, what about all the people that are affected on the other side of town? Um, so what role do they play in all of this? I'll start and you can join you, but that will be a long answer. So I'll start from the very basis of everything is our constitution. Our constitution is, you know, is worked out in a manner that we are a quasi-federal country, we're not a fully federal. So you have a list of union list which is which comprises of subject matters that only central government will deal with and enact laws only for that particular subject matters. You have a union list, then there's a state list which provides subject matters of where exactly would be only for the state to enact laws. And then you have a concurrent list where if state already has a law in that list then that will uh, prevail. However, if there is no, if there's a gap in law and it falls in concurrent then central government can enact. So in, from that perspective, you have, now again it's complex because environment per se is not a subject that is pro provided in its clear form in any of these lists. There are land, land is a state subject, then you have rivers which are falling in concurrent and also the interlinkage of rivers because we are a vast country with long rivers across different states, that part, portion falls in the union list. So starting from that perspective, Environment was treated as something that could be dealt with under two articles, Article 48 of the Constitution for the state and state would mean the central government to start because at some point there needs to be a start because in 1950 when the Constitution was enacted, maybe science was not so far and, and we did not have full-fledged environmental sense as we have today because of our own consequences, our own actions. With that perspective, uh, there is uh, in act, so whenever questions of land comes, then you have issues of town planning, then you have issues of uh, uh, forest, you have issues of uh, wetlands and other areas. So that all fall within the revenue lands and therefore state has been given a free flow in enacting laws which will not be in say conflict with the central law. Central law would be the environment act. And what Ministry of Environment and Central Government would generally do would frame the larger law and within that law they will impart the 
uh, responsibility towards state level officers only because central government in this big of a country can't take any action straight away. Now, when you now there's another thing which happened in our country in the 1970s was the 74th and 73rd and 74th amendment, which further decentralized a lot of actions to the municipal level and further down the state and to panchayats, further down to village level. And for that, so, so for urban area, your municipal corporation became uh, an important uh, decision maker. And for village uh, level, it's panchayat. Now, in that segment as well, when it comes to say solid waste management, when it comes to say uh, implementing issues of uh, cleanliness, daily cleanliness, all of that form part of the core municipal level. Now, the problem is that with this aspect, if say municipal corporation of Mumbai wants to construct a bridge. So for construction of that particular bridge, the clearance is given by a state level authority. So it is not the case that municipal corporation will think tonight that from tomorrow I want to construct a bridge. It can't just suddenly go and construct. It has to apply for an environment clearance at the state level. So clearances are at state levels and decision makers to send a proposal are at the municipal level. So the clearance providers are the main guys in that sense at central. And if it if it goes beyond a larger threshold limit, if it is of extreme you know likelihood of causing uh, impact on the environment, then it goes to the central level. So decision makers ultimately who give grant you licenses are at central and state. But anybody can init initiate a project and seek clearance from them. So this is how it functions. Now town planning is another aspect which of course requires at the state level to make sure your open spaces are fine, your gardens are maintained. And that's a policy level again which is separate. I, I, I don't know if that answers yeah, your question. Yeah, it makes sense, but okay. I just don't understand. Surely in these instances where they haven't gotten environmental clearance, who is going to hold them accountable? Because like you said, you someone can get a fine, but I don't understand why aren't there if actual researchers doing research from the, let's say, the ministry that actually ha can hold them accountable because if someone just says, oh yeah, it's fine, build a bridge, who's, where's the environmental clearance coming from? Like, why is it not being implemented? When, at a point when there is no environment clearance that is being uh, you know, sought to be even asked for, just as an example, when it comes to coastal road, yeah. the corporation did not even apply for an environment clearance because according to them, the road, a road, is not required to get one. However, this was the main argument even in the High Court. The, all the people who had opposed the Coastal Road project, including organizations and individuals who opposed, they clearly said that if you look at the larger project, what is the overarching purpose of this project? It may be the road, but road is only the 20% of reclamation of 117 hectares. So what happens to the remaining? That, that much of reclamation has to be treated as something called an area development project. And the high court was like, yes, it is not just a road because you are making gardens, cycle parks, bus parking facilities along the coastal road. So surely this is not just a road, it is an area development project, 117 hectares, hence you have to get an environment clearance. So it's sometimes the work of lawyers where they, they you know, go on to the grey area of what is a road and what is an area development project and you wait for and ultimately you have to go to the last arbiter to the court and ultimately you, the court gives a decision in your favour, you are very happy because at least there will be some you know, change in the mindset and they will not continue with the plan but our amazing you know, decision makers choose to go to the Supreme Court and we have an all four line order on the basis of which it's not a final judgement, the court matter is still pending and that order clearly says that every work that happens will be subject to the outcome of this particular appeal. I mean, it's nothing, it's, it's, it can, it, it holds no value now. Because with that stay order, entire irreparable damage has already occurred. You won't believe that when we were uh, documenting some more work, some more evidence for that particular region near Burley, at the Burley Sea phase, we found that those rocks are actually 80 million years old, which were there at the Burley Sea phase. They were not like tetrapods that you have on Marine Trend, but they were actual old ocean, ocean rocks that had existed there for during the Jurassic era. And it had its own uh, you know, intertidal biodiversity, marine biodiversity right there. So we lost that. I mean, what they could have alternatively done was you know, have, 
have it on stilts at least, but don't reclaim it today's time. And here are some decision makers, you know, have, have, it, have it their way. And when it comes to giving an environment clearance, when the proposal comes, it ultimately depends on who are the persons who are taking that decision. Are they being fed with some predetermined decision already? Are they being pressurized to do an X activity or a Y activity? It's quite common in India. Be it the, to, to, to cater to a mind or for a large ticket, big ticket, uh, big ticket project for political points, it's quite common in So the decision, so what ultimately boils down to who the people are who are taking decisions. The laws are in place, and if good people are implementing it, it will be great. Bad people are implementing it, it will be great. So I'm not an expert, but so this might sound like a naive question. But from the entire discussion, the idea that I got was that there seems to be a real gap between the executive and just the very basic needs of the people. Like extremely basic, simple day-to-day -day requirements and what the executive is doing. The, how do you, I mean, how do you, so this is the naive question, how do you explain such a big gulf between these two and um, suggest any ways to bridge that gulf, if at all? See, from my, from my elementary perspective, I think it is all about the training of these officers and these bureaucrats. When they are made into an IAS officer, we generally keep the, the you know, crossing a UPSC exam, culturally in India is considered as such a, such, a, such a massive step. And I don't know, perhaps having passed that exam and the kind of training happens right after that really requires further sensitization and connection with people. But I believe the training would include that, although I have not seen it personally. However, eventually, you know, what is what is the length of, uh, you know, mental strength that they hold while taking decisions? Because uh, one way or the other, each of these officers ultimately face pressure, either at the municipal level in India, or at the state, or at the central level. So, and with this continuous culture that exists, in the system, once that person enters the system, you may have that great training. I'm not saying the training will be bad, perhaps it may have been great. Yeah, they, they espouse the idea of ensuring you speak to people and really consider suggestions, if that is the case. But the system, when they enter, and realize that the real decision makers at cabinet level, who are, of course, the legislators and the people who have been voted to come to power and take a decision, they just bulldoze over the thoughts of IAS officers or the, their opinions. It's something that, you know, does play a role. So, if you look at the cycle, I think somewhere the cycle does come back to whom we vote for. We'll call it like an evening today, because we're already running late, like I said. I think what I'd like to do is just before we end, uh, sort of summarize, I think the two takeaways that I, you know, got from this discussion, I'm sure, you know, you have perhaps different takeaways or, you know, uh, many more takeaways, but I had sort of two takeaways that I'm taking back. One is, of course, I think uh, the one takeaway as a lawyer that I'd like to think about more is how our planning laws can improve. What are the sort of amendments needed in our planning laws? And that's perhaps the first question that I started out with. And it was primarily the reason I kept it as a first question is because I started off with this idea that I think somewhere planning is failing. And which is why my first question to Zaman was, you know, do you think environment is an afterthought when it comes to planning our cities? So, I, I, the answer I get from someone is, and we've heard enough examples, is, is that it definitely seems to be an afterthought. And perhaps the mandate needs to come from the law itself, the text of the law needs to change, our planning law needs to change to sort of incorporate the environment in and have the two of them sit side by side and not so, sort of sit opposite each other. That's the first takeaway. I think the second takeaway that I got was, you know, more of an observation that we made throughout the conversation is that it, it seems the situation, at least when it comes to the environmental law jurisprudence in the country, seems to be a little bleak right now with successive amendments being made to our environmental laws at the central level, executive directions being used to sort of dilute protections, etc. It does seem to be a very bleak situation, not just that. Implementation of the law also seems to be uh, not quite meeting the spirit of the law. It doesn't, the two, the two don't seem to be, you know, sort of matching. Given that this is the situation, I think our citizens, regular citizens, their movements are extremely important. And um, I think that sort of gets me 
to what Zaman said, you know, his answer to citizens' movements is that I think all of us have a responsibility at some, you know, in some way or the other to sort of like just notice what's happening around you in your neighborhoods, you know, to the people who are working for you, perhaps, you know, perhaps not directly to you, but people who, you know, come in, you know, perhaps you, the, the, the domestic workers who come into your lives, etc. Uh, the security guards, where do they live? What, is the, what are the sort of problems they are facing? You know, is is the park in your neighborhood, what's happening to that park? Is it being maintained or not? I think just be a little more conscious about your surroundings uh, is I think one thing. The second thing that he said was that if you feel like you have the time, then perhaps approach your ward level officer, raise it as a complaint, see if it can move forward, etc. Um, and the third, of course, thing is that if you can't do any of that, then perhaps support organizations who work on the ground, you know, perhaps financially, uh, spreading spreading their, you know, just on social media, speaking about their work, spread like, you know, talking about their work, etc. Just support these organizations in any way that you can. I think, uh, I think that's the sort of other takeaway I have is that the situation looks really bleak, but I think we as citizens can do something, we as citizens can definitely do something in the next few months and, you know, when we go voting. But not just that, not just at the election level, but perhaps on an everyday level, everyday basis also, there is a lot that we can do as individuals. Uh, so I think those are the two takeaways for me. And I would really like to thank Zaman once more for sort of, you know, spending almost two hours with us today. Uh, in a very, very busy week. Uh, and also to our audience for showing up and like spending two hours with us today on the Friday evening. Uh, really, thank you.